This is uh, Introduction to Visual Analytics Lecture 1.4 for IIT 355. The next segment that uh, we'd like to talk about is a, a, a brief history of uh, visualization and visual analytics. But first, one of the things I'd like to talk about is that there are a number of ways to think uh, about visualization. And what I'm showing here is a number of fields that um, members of whom experts in from, say, computer science, psychology, design, and art have something to say and something to investigate with respect to the use and deployment of visualization. The first one listed here is computer science. And what computer science scientists tend to be interested in is computer graphics and interfa user interface design, concerned with presenting data to users by means of images, basically what the topic of the course is about. And the kind of thing that computer scientists are interested in doing is, among other things, creating tools or methods for generating in, uh, images from multi-dimensional data. It's um, computer scientists focus on the techniques, developing, designing, improving the techniques for generating images on, say, multi-dimensional data uh, using the computer, as you might expect. The next thing listed here is psychology, and what we're uh, psychologists are interested in in the domain of visualization is the formation of mental visual images and the way in which our perception and cognition interact and hopefully improve uh, when uh, people are attempting to do visual, anal anal visual analysis by the use of uh, visual imagery such as visualizations. And so really psychologists are interested in the act of interpreting in visual terms and are studying perception and cognition as a means to get there. From the design perspective, what uh, design is about is the pr process of putting into visual form um, various artifacts and uh, ways of understanding the world. And uh, it's the practice of assembling images that clearly communicate in a culturally relevant manner. So the expertise that designers are bringing to bear is a little bit different from computing. At CET, we're doing uh, quite a, uh, you know, a mix of these things. Um, uh, designers, however, are in overtly trained in the aspects of uh, cultural valence of the, the, the work that they're doing. Finally, at the, on this list, we have art where visualization can be considered as a medium uh, and representations or data are used to create art and to provoke and invoke feelings about the underlying uh, data or perhaps the data plus the visualization put together. So those four perspectives, it's not, those are, of course, not the only ones you could imagine taking, are uh, going to inform us throughout um, the term or throughout the uh, progress through the course IAT355. So now let's talk briefly about um, the history of visualization. Um, it turns out that uh, people have doing, been doing geographic visualizations for a long time. It's not necessarily the case that I have dug, dug up the oldest possible map ever known, um, but this thing I'm showing you here is called Tabla Putingeriana. It's a lengthy mouthful of a name, uh, mainly named that because uh, a guy named Putinger in Austria uh, had the, uh, the, a copy of this 22 foot long um, scroll on parchment that depicted the Roman Empire um, of, uh, in classical times of about uh, AD um, 32 or something like that. The map that we're seeing here is actually uh, a reworking of this um, uh, this this scroll in particular the, uh, s s the what we're seeing here and the upper part this is Britain Britannia as you can see here there's Ireland and this is Spain and Portugal over here and Morocco uh, and here's the Mediterranean and Ibiza is in here somewhere um, <clears throat> the thing that's interesting about this map is that it is uh, from the perspective of the actual shape of the geography, it's very much distorted. And the reason why it's distorted, of course, is so that it can fit on a scroll. This map ex continues to extend off to the right all the way uh, to Arabia, and actually it has India in the far uh, right end of the map. And you can find that online on the Wikipedia page. The reason for the distortion is, to, of course, to fit the physical medium that it's drawn on. And also, it's a recognition that uh, uh, of the primary use of this thing is to um, uh, create itineraries for people traveling from city to city along the Roman roads. 
And so what you see here, this is a city called Tarragona in uh, west, uh, eastern Spain. Uh, and this is roughly Seville. And these are the stops that you could take along the road going from Tarragona to Seville. Um, and uh, Barcelona is here. It's actually a small, a small stop at this time, whereas Tarragona is a bigger city. Um, and basically what's of interest to the Roman traveler is what are the stops along the way? What's the itinerary going to look like as you travel from place to place? And uh, modern subway maps uh, adopt the same insight in that it, the geographic veracity is useful, but it's not the central thing of interest. You're interested in what are the stops along the way, and this is an, an, an ancient example. Um, the accounting for this indicates uh, uh, the historical view of this thing is that this is a medieval re reconstruction of an ancient map that had been revised a few times uh, in the first um, 400 years of, of uh, the previous millennium of uh, the years uh, 0 AD through 400. Um, another visualization that I, I'm sure you'll be uh, interested in, and this is a uh, called Nightingale's Coxcomb because it looks vaguely like uh, uh, a coxcomb, um, the head of a chicken, but uh, what it is, it's a radial map that illustrates the uh, change in mortality in hospitals that were being run by Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War. And uh, the, um, you know, sort of mortality in hospitals was sort of at the same level as uh, British cities, and that's what this inner circle here is intended to illustrate. Uh, and then as people got injured and started showing up, the death rate in those hospitals increased very, very significantly, as and you can see that here. The area of this segment is indicates the number of deaths per thousand, and it's very, very significant. And one of the uh, innovations that uh, Florence Nightingale brought to bear was this thing that she says here, which is the uh, commencement of sanitary improvements. That's what it says in her script here. Um, she introduced various sanitation measures and that very, very significantly impacted uh, the prognosis of all the people who were staying in the hospital and it dropped the death rate very significantly, as you can see. So th you were intended to read this thing clockwise. Death rates are high. Uh, she introduces sanitary improvements and death rates fall very significantly. It's a very strong indication of uh, the importance of sanitation and, you know, uh, clean hospitals, which was a new idea at the time in the mid-1850s. Uh, Here's another famous uh, 19th century um, illustration, uh, visualization. This is uh, Menard's famous illustration done in 1869 of um, Napoleon's invasion of Russia. Um, here, Napoleon invaded Russia with, uh, in, according to the map, 422,000 uh, 400, uh, 422, men, and uh, this is roughly in uh, Lithuania, uh, where he started uh, in roughly uh, eastern Poland. He marched towards Moscow, and what was happening is that the Russians were uh, harassing his army and then retreating, harassing and retreating, until he gets to Moscow in uh, September. And then winter starts to set in very early, and Napoleon has to travel back. And the uh, outcome of this is that Napoleon invaded with 422,000 men and returned with 10,000 men. Very, very significant um, uh, impact on the size of the army, and it had a huge impact on the French Empire of the time uh, in 1812 and 13. The thing at the bottom is a very interesting uh, uh, parallel display. It's an indicator of the temperature uh, at key time points on the way back, um, so temperature got temperatures got to minus 30 Celsius um, as he was traveling back from from Russia through uh, Western Russia and Poland and so on and so forth. So a very significant military disaster that had significant uh, political impl implications, and the map really depicts it, and it also depicts the key factor as to why. Here's another uh, uh, 1854 uh, map. This one is. Also about disease, in this case, this is about a cholera epidemic that uh, was causing a lot of deaths in London. And Jon Snow ha was pursuing what it was a radical idea at the time called the germ theory of uh, disease. And that is to say, d disease being caused by small organisms that people ingest. Um, and uh, one of the things he was interested in is he, as many others, noticed that 
cholera seemed to be very localized. You would be there would be a neighborhood where cholera was, and outside that neighborhood there weren't many people with cholera. And what he did is he took a map and mapped the location of people dying, and he noticed that kind of at the center of the map, uh, the highest rate of death indicated by that circle there. Um, there, uh, he started asking. What he did is he started asking around, and he had this idea of asking what, you know, what air do you, you know, what air do you breathe? Where do you get your food? Where do you get your water? And it turns out it's not visible in this particular blow up, but many of the people in this neighborhood got water from a single pump, uh, because you know there wasn't running water uh, piped in automatically um, that was located there. And the reason why they got water from there is the water tasted good. So he did something radical and uh, very unpopular at the time, is he took the handle off of the water pump. And the outcome was the cholera deaths decreased very significantly immediately thereafter. Um, not overnight, but within the week. So this was a, a, a key element in the discovery of the, and confirmation of the germ uh, theory of disease. And Florence Nightingale's thing is also an example of pursuing a theory of uh, the germ theory of disease uh, and doing things to combat it. Um, I had spoken earlier with the uh, Roman map about uh, the use of geographic distortion. Uh, here is a visualization of the actual geography of London's underground in 1927. And this thing was an actual map used by the London underground system at that time. Uh, but one of the things that is a problem with this map is, is that it's a little hard to use. And part of the reason why it's hard to use is that, as you can see, there's a high density of stations here in the central London area. Uh, because there's lots of uh, people wanting to travel into the central business di district, as it were. Uh, and as you go outward from the central region, the stations, uh, you know, there's a greater distance between stations, there's a greater distance between, um, between uh, subway lines, between underground lines. And uh, the challenge here is that it doesn't use space to the greatest level of e efficiency. And so um, the new at that time, the late 1920s map uh, took a, uh, the same approach that that Roman uh, map does, and that is to distort the geography to more strongly emphasize the connection between the routes. And because there's a lot of uh, interconnectivity, particularly in the central region, the central region is expanded and, and more space is created so that it, uh, it, you can uh, observe which line is traveling where more clearly uh, the color coding is the same as previously, and you can uh, clearly understand where you need to travel in order to get, say, from Totteridge and Whetstone up here down to Elephant and Castle, or from there to Kensington High, High Street, Kensington. Um, so, in any case, you, you know you know where you want are, and you know where you want to go. Um, and planning in a map like this is a little bit easier than in the previous thing, simply because there's enough space for you to be able to see where it is you get to change trains. Um, part of the techniques here is to eliminate unnecessary detail. In this case, the sort of the real geography, an inset of which is shown on the right, is, is reformulated and distorted to show uh, lines only on horizontal, verti uh, vertical, and 45 degree se segments. And the key insight, of course, is that topology and relative locations of stations is more important uh, than the details of where uh, the stations are geographically. So the reasons why we use visualization are to do one of three possible things. First is to explain. You want to communicate the result of a previously completed analysis. And those map displays, uh, most of those displays that we've shown previously, the Nightingale Scales, Coxcomb, the, uh, the, the um, cholera map, um, the London Underground map, their primary job uh, is to explain uh, something real. Um, uh, the, the germ theory and the impact of sanitary um, uh, activities uh, in, in uh, Nightingale's case um, and you know sort of geographic layout simplified so that you can make your train underground train connection. Second is something that we do spend a bit of time concentrating in the course is to analyze. You want to explore the data to understand and guide subsequent analysis and in fact you'd like to be able to use the system as we said in the previous segment uh, the uh, visualization system to analyze and continue and refine your analysis and extend your analysis within a tool and that's something that we talk about uh, in throughout the course and finally to inspire you want to engage and motivate or perhaps disturb some people 
to get the message across. And um, uh, each of these things has their own kind of lens by which you want to view things. You would imagine that uh, uh, art and design might be focused a little bit more on inspiring, uh, whereas computing uh, folks might be focusing on analysis. Okay. So speaking of uh, explaining, uh, I'll briefly take you through a little bit of a case study of uh, the Challenger disaster. So uh, in, uh, I think it was 1984, uh, the space shuttle uh, Challenger took off, lifted off in January, uh, and exploded about uh, a minute and a half into the launch. And um, there, a presidential commission was put together to determine why this happened. And here is two of the 13 pages sent to NASA by the company that made parts for the Challenger space shuttle. And as you can imagine, it's a little bit hard to understand. It's got these annotations around it. Uh, it has these, uh, you know, tables of numbers. It's a little bit, a little bit uh, hard to understand. So one of the things that um, was hoped to improve it is that uh, the people, the, uh, Morton Firecall, who uh, had a hand in uh, developing the booster rocket shown here in schematic form, uh, put together a history of O-ring damage uh, to um, to the uh, the booster rockets, and they also plotted the temperature of the launch. So here we see a display that's intended to be read left to right, one, two, three, etc., up to twenty-four, uh, and um, what kind of damage had occurred to the solid uh, solid fuel uh, booster rockets. And you can see there's an annotation here for some damage here, here, and some more damage here, and so on and so forth. The problem with this display is as uh, Edward Tufte says that this is uh, uh, this display has a lot of information that's a little bit redundant. The, there's a, a repetition over and over of the outline of the rocket and the sort of the geometry of the rocket, but that doesn't really help uh, the viewer, the uh, the user of this display gain an understanding of whether there's a relationship between temperature or anything else with respect to the rocket. And that's something, this use and reuse of the rocket booster outline is what Tufty calls chart junk. Um, what's really important is to gain an understanding of the relationships between the various factors and the kind of the rocket images get in the way of that. Here, instead, is a better and more understandable plot that really gets at the factors that um, that you know had a, a, an influence and in fact a causative factor to the disaster. So what's being shown here is the a plot of O-ring damage on the vertical axis versus um, the temperature at the time of launch. And what you can see here that uh, uh, upon which are a kind of a regression line has been drawn. In this case, it's a regression curve. There's not a lot of data, but uh, unlike the um, uh, thing that we showed the other day about education versus um, uh, income. Here, um, I think you can make a case that uh, fitting a curve is a little bit more uh, useful and valuable than fitting a single line segment. In any case, what this, uh, this plot clearly shows is that as the temperature decreases, there is a greater incidence of O-ring damage. Um, and you can infer this curve, and it would um, seem to indicate that if the temperature falls below 50 degrees, what you're going to get is pretty much certain O-ring damage. The Challenger was launched in uh, January 1986. The ambient temperature at the time was uh, below freezing, and as a result, um, <clears throat> the Challenger blew up. So there's the indicator, you know, of the primary cause of the disaster. Now, this this... This is the primary technical cause, as it were. There were a whole bunch of uh, professional causes in which people didn't know about this relationship. Those who did know about it didn't really communicate to the decision makers. And there's all sorts of things that caused this disaster. This is really just focusing on the technical cause of you know, why the rockets blew up at, at the moment and not so much about the social causes surrounding the decision making. Okay, so that's a very brief uh, intro to uh, uh, visualization history, just to give you an indicator um, that, you know, folks have been doing visualization for quite a long time. Um, and to just give you a, a, a brief uh, overview of some ideas that you will see again in the in, uh, course of visualization.